Hey everybody, today we're going to show you the absolute easiest way to install a brand new outdoor receptacle on your house or garage. This video will show you everything, how to locate your box position, wire it, install the junction box, and weatherproof it, all from start to finish, and using the fastest, safest method that I feel is very easy to achieve. We're going to go into a lot of detail here. And to make this video, I teamed up with New Blue, my new content partners for everything HVAC, plumbing, and electrical. New Blue is a great home service company right here in North Carolina, servicing major regions of the state. They're highly professional, they do top-notch work, and I was super excited to team up with both Chris Holmes and New Blue co-founder Jimmy Geiler for this project. New Blue is helping me turn my garage into a shop studio space. We're tackling multiple projects in here, including a new recessed light array, which I'll document in another video. But they're also installing a ductless mini-split HVAC unit here on this exterior wall. And as Jimmy pointed out, you're required by code to have an exterior outlet in close range of a mini-split or a condenser unit. That's so a technician has power to plug into if they have to service the unit. I thought it was a great opportunity to show how easy this is to do, especially when you have a setup similar to mine. Because while we could pull a new 12-2 line from the box to the outlet for this project, as we were doing for the recessed lights, we actually decided to go with the much simpler option, which is to wire this exterior outlet directly from an interior outlet in the room. I like this method because it's so much faster, requires far fewer tools, and works great for so many outlet areas in a house or garage. It also means we can piggyback off of an existing GFCI outlet near the panel, which makes it that much easier. So let's jump in and show you how all that works. But first, please remember that this is just an informational video. Electrical work is inherently dangerous, and you should always hire a professional service company, like New Blue, to tackle projects for you if you feel underqualified. Any work you carry out is at your own risk, so please keep that in mind. All right, our desired outlet location is on the wall farthest away from the panel. And if you look down below, you see that a string of outlets encircles the room. They're all on the same circuit. It starts with this GFCI and works around the full perimeter, winding up at this last outlet near the old garage door. That's roughly where we're going to park our new outlet on the building exterior. Also notice that the garage has a 100 amp sub panel, which means that we'll have plenty of power for the mini split. And the breakers in this box are 20 amp. You can see this at the sub panel or even on the outlets themselves, which have the little T slot that indicates 20 amp service at that outlet. So a 20 amp circuit means that we want to use 12 gauge Romex wire. 14 gauge wire would be too thin and would violate code for a 20 amp load. So we're using 12 gauge. And we're using 12 2 wire because we have no three way switches on this circuit. So that's our power supply equipment. All right. Here's our game plan. The general idea is that we're going to poke a short line through the wall and directly connect this last outlet to our new outlet outside, thereby providing it with power. We want the outlets pretty close to each other to make locating the wire easier because, as Chris points out, we have R13 bat insulation in the wall and that can make fishing the wire through much trickier on a project like this. So we'll be shooting to have our exterior outlet maybe three to four inches higher because that'll let us push wire into the wall cavity and drop it down to the existing outlet. And we're gonna do this while producing little to no damage to either the interior or exterior wall. Okay, the first thing we wanna do here always is kill the power to the circuit. You can flip the breaker at the panel, or in this case, we just hit the test button on the first GFCI outlet near the panel. That kills power to this whole circuit around the room. Later, when we're wiring, We'll still test the outlet again just to be sure, but power is now dead at all the lower outlets around the room. So let's map out the new outlet location. The first thing Chris does is use a folding ruler to find the exact height of the top of the outlet from the subfloor. It's right at about 13 inches. And he has also already measured from the inside corner of our room and knows that our outlet location is seven feet from the wall. To begin plotting this, he comes to our nearest opening, which is the old garage door, adds our three inches of extra elevation, and marks about 16 inches on the RO stud. You could do this with a finished door jam as well, if that's what you have. Chris then wisely uses our siding courses as a way to visually line up this elevation on the exterior of the building. There is a small drop as the siding wraps around the corner, 
But Chris keeps this in mind as he follows that course along the side of the building. Here, he's already measured seven feet from the point where the interior wall would sit, and he's made a mark here on the siding. So he and Jimmy hold the weatherproof box horizontally right at this mark, just below the siding course. The little ledge provided by the siding will aid us in waterproofing and help us create a level appearance. Chris marks the pass-through hole in the back of the box onto the siding with a pencil, and we have our wiring penetration point. Jimmy then uses a 5 8 inch speed paddle bit to bore through both the hardy plank siding and the half-inch OSB sheathing behind it. He punches through to the empty stud bay on the other side, and here you see we can now fish the Romex directly into the wall cavity. Inside, Chris removes the faceplate and mounting screws and pulls out the existing gang of wires in the box. He leaves the outlet wired up, but hangs it down so it's out of the way. Keep in mind, our power is still off, and we've tested it with the circuit tester. Now, there's a sizable gap around the box where they cut the drywall pretty far back at first installation, and Chris uses that gap to shine his light into the wall cavity above the box. He's looking for the end of the Romex wire that Jimmy is pushing into the wall. Chris is using a screwdriver to feel around for the end of the Romex as Jimmy swings it in the wall cavity. Eventually, they connect, and Chris manages to direct the end of the Romex out of the gap around the junction box. He pulls a generous amount through to remove kinks. Then he back feeds it until he has just a few inches left and also pushes back the outer housing or jacket on the Romex to reveal about an inch of the three wires inside. Now, this blue junction box, like many others, has two small knockout ports at the top. You can see where Chris has punched out the plastic caps and we now have two gaps in the back of the box. These will be our wire entry points. This is probably the trickiest part of the whole installation, and really, it's more tedious than complicated. But Chris has to manipulate the wires so they fish down through one of these ports, and he really just does this by using a combination of a screwdriver and a couple pairs of pliers. You see he gets the exposed wires lined up with the right opening and begins working them through. He can be pretty rough with the wires in this case because we're going to trim any damaged portions. So he uses a screwdriver like a lever to adjust the angle of the wire a bit while pulling down through the port with his pliers. And occasionally he has Jimmy back pull the Romex just a tiny bit if he needs to reset his angle. Before long, Chris has the full Romex line pulled through and plenty of slack drawn out. So he uses an electrician's blade to quickly split the sleeve and cut it back close to the entry point in the box. Then he removes the paper insulation and exposes our three wires. He keeps the ground wire isolated. That's the bare copper wire. This is the wire that will trip the breaker in the event of a ground fault. It's kind of a safe pathway for an increased electrical charge. The full ground pathway literally goes all the way back through the sub panel, through a conduit in the ground, into the main panel outside, and then into a grounding rod beside that panel. That's where the ground wire should always ultimately terminate into the negatively charged earth below us. So, we have to attach the ground wire on the new outlet to the ground wire on the old outlet to make it part of the ground pathway. But, there's only one screw terminal for the ground on the outlet. We can't hook two wires on here. So, Chris has to make a pigtail connection by introducing a third piece of wire. To do this, he just cuts about a one-foot section of Romex, pulls off the jacket, and separates out the bare copper ground wire. Then he unhooks the old ground wire from the screw terminal by just loosening the screw. He pulls the wire free, then pairs it up with the bare ground wire coming from the outside outlet so they're side by side. Now he puts a curve in the pigtail and adds it to the pair of wires to form a tight trio. And here Chris actually pre-twists the three a bit so they're more tightly conjoined. He says it's disputed whether you really need to do this or not if you're using a twist connector, but he does it regardless with a pair of linesman pliers. Then he uses the snips on the pliers to cut the twisted wire even and remove the portion damaged by the plier teeth. He then twists on a wire nut in a clockwise direction. This wire nut is from a company called Ideal, and it's basically a universal nut that handles all the common sizes. Chris likes using a twist wire nut here instead of a crimp connection because a twist nut is reversible, which will help if we ever need to change this outlet again later. He tucks the full pigtail back into the box, but keeps the third piece of free wire exposed. He twists the end into a little hook with about an eighth inch radius using needle-nosed pliers, 
and he twists it so it curls up to the left. He does it in this direction so that when he tucks the wire hook behind the terminal screw, tightening the screw in a clockwise direction will wrap the wire hook more tightly, clamping it harder. You can even see it rotating in a bit. This is a code requirement. If he hooked the other way, then clockwise screw turning would actually push it out and untwist it. That would result in a bad connection and a weaker grounding path. So, always curl your wires in a clockwise direction. But, the pigtail ground is on securely. Now we can do the other wires. Chris points out damage on the wire sheathings from pulling them through the wall, so he cuts that off with his pliers. Then he uses the 12 gauge hole on his wire stripper to pull off about three quarters of an inch of both jackets exposing bare wire. This is what we're going to insert into the terminals on the outlet. If you're curious exactly how much bare wire you should expose, be aware that some outlets actually have a strip gauge on the back. They'll show you a correct length and you can use that to mark and test if you've stripped enough or too much. This is important because as Chris points out, you don't want any copper showing outside of screw clamp terminals like this one. Exposed copper outside of this terminal housing can be a potential failure point. So Chris actually repositions this old wire to be in a little bit further. And then checking his new wire, he realizes he's got too much copper exposed. So he trims the wire back a bit and installs it into the clamp hole. Also, we're installing the neutral wire first. That's the white wire. The neutral wire carries unused electricity back to the power source. It's the one we want to attach after the ground wire because we still aren't introducing any potential current. Even if the power's off, this is the safest sequence. For these outlet types, Chris just pushes the wire down into the terminal hole, then tightens down the clamp screw, trapping the wire in place. Now the old neutral is connected to the new neutral on that side of the outlet. Chris then spins the receptacle and finally connects the hots. Black wires, or sometimes red wires, are always the hot wire. They bring power into the device. And you know which side they're supposed to go on because they usually connect to screw terminals that are gold in color. The neutral whites on the other side will connect to terminals that are silverish in color. But with everything tightly connected, Chris does the pull test. He literally pulls on the wires to make sure they're secure. A firm pull should not be able to dislodge them. If it does, you need to screw them down more tightly. All of this looks good though. Everything's on its appropriate side. So Chris works the wires back into the junction box. He tries to fold and tuck things neatly so that they sort of accordion into the box. When they're pushed in, he can line up the mounting screws for the outlet and start turning them into their tapped holes. Then he can slide back on his plate cover and screw that to the tapped holes on the outlet. He clocks his screws so that the slots are vertical. That's an aesthetic choice. And like that, the inside outlet is done. Okay, outside now, we can begin to mount and hook up the exterior outlet. We're going to be mounting this one gang weatherproof box from Centaur. This is a metal box, which has some particular wiring instructions. Chris starts by closing up our extra knockout holes with threaded seal plugs. You just screw these plugs in. We don't want any more penetrations into the box than what we need, which is just the one at the back that the wire will come through. Next, he also attaches these little mounting brackets. These are sort of like mending plates, and they just screw on with supplied hardware. We're going to mount horizontally, so Chris places one high, and then positions the other one caddy corner and low. This way, both levels of the box will draw tightly to the wall when we screw them on. And the other thing we need to add is the chase nipple. This is a little metal conduit that the wire will pass through. This one has a plastic sleeve that floats inside. This sleeve helps prevent the wire from chafing against the sharp edges of the junction box, which would possibly cause damage to the wire. It just screws into threads in the back of the junction box. Chris turns it down tightly with his needle nose pliers. Now he pulls the Romex through the chase and positions the box so it sits just under the siding course above. This way, we'll be able to seal right at this seam for waterproofing at the wall. And I'm pretty sure he's using one inch stainless steel hex head screws for mounting the box. They may be self-drilling screws or they may be typical screw points, but he just uses a nut driver bit and drives them so they're firmly seated, but not too tight. You don't want to damage your siding with too much pressure. Now you'll notice that this box also has an internal grounding screw connection. 
This is because, as mentioned, the box is metal, which means that it too has to be grounded, otherwise it could pose an electrocution risk if a hot wire came into contact with the box frame. So, to start our wiring connections, Chris strips the jacket off our Romex using the 12-2 holes on his wire stripper. He cuts pretty close to the chase nipple, but leaves a bit of jacket exposed. You want at least a quarter inch of that sheathing in the box. This chase doesn't have a clamp on it, so to keep the wire stable in the chase, Chris crimps all the wires sideways a bit. This produces a small kink, which prevents the wire from slipping farther back into the chase. And now he has the difficult task of bending the grounding wire around the ground screw terminal. Once again, he curls the wire in a clockwise direction and then hooks it around and behind the screw head. This is tricky because there just isn't much room in the box and you wanna be sure the wire is really well seated. So Chris uses his needle nose pliers to gently shape the wire as he turns the screw down. Eventually he's got it wrapped and tightened with plenty of ground wire still exposed. He then groups the excess ground with the hot and neutral wires and cuts all three off with about three inches or four inches of wire exposure outside the box. He then uses his wire strippers to bend hooks onto each of the exposed wire ends. The outlet we're connecting to will require these screw type hook connections. And again, we're not using a GFCI outlet here because we already have one much farther upstream on this circuit right beside the panel. That outlet protects this one from ground faults. If we did not have a GFCI further upstream, then we would definitely need to install one outside here. Even with this weather box, you still need GFCI protection on an exterior outlet. I don't yet have a video on installing a GFCI outlet, but my good buddy Scott Dixon does, so I'll link his video here and below in the description. It's a very similar wiring job to hook one up. But moving on, the receptacle we're using here is a weather-resistant duplex model. You can tell it's weather-resistant because it has these WRs stamped into it. And the funny thing is, it's not weather-resistant against water, but instead against UV. Plastic breaks down quickly under UV rays, so these outlet casings are formulated to be more durable against sunlight. That's just an interesting fact. But to install the receptacle, Chris begins training the wire hooks onto their appropriate terminals. Green for the ground wire, silver for the white neutral wire. And he does have an empty terminal screw on this side because there's no wire leaving this receptacle to go elsewhere. So he just tightens that one down because it's one less thing that might possibly cause an arc somewhere in the box. It's more secure this way. He then comes over to the gold terminals on the far side and hooks on his hot black wire. It doesn't really matter which terminal screw it goes on. It's just the same process, turning clockwise to tighten down on the wire. And once again, Chris tightens down the spare screw as well. After a pull test, he begins tucking his wires into the box as neatly as possible, so there's less risk of producing a short or fault in the box. And then he screws the receptacle to the threaded holes in the box, but he does leave the screws just a little bit loose because we now need to put the waterproof cover on the box. We're using this Tamax in-use cover. The in-use part is important. I'll show you why in a second. But first, he needs to install the right faceplate trim. This kit comes with several options. We're going for this duplex faceplate because that matches our receptacle. The old one just pops out backwards with pressure and Chris can press the new one in from behind. Notice the large weather seal gasket on the back of the box. That's part of our weatherproofing. But to finish getting the box ready, he also has to flip the cover. That way it will rotate upward from the hinge knuckles along the top side. You can do this by just inserting the plastic pin into the barrel on top. It just snaps into place. Then he slips the cover over the faceplate and slides it down so the screws catch in their keyholes. Then he tightens the screws. Now, the reason we call this an in-use box is because you can pop out this plastic gate down here and that lets you insert a cord up into the box and plug it into the outlet while the cover is down. This weather protects the cord at all times. It's way better than the old designs, which pretty much stayed flipped open, and it's absolutely what you want for an outdoor box cover. All right, that's the outlet fully installed. But to make sure the box itself is better waterproofed, I finish things off by adding a bead of clear sealant around the seams at the wall. 
I wanted to use Lexel, but couldn't find any. And that's fine because DAP and other companies make their own variants of that sealant now. This is not silicone. This formulation is clearer than silicone, more flexible, and can be painted once it cures, which you can't do with silicone. So it's really a superior product that bonds to everything, even when wet. I'll be sure to link some. I just run about a quarter inch bead on the top and sides where the box meets the wall. I leave the bottom seam open so water can run out if it somehow gets back there. But I'm just using a little squeeze bottle, which is a great option if you don't have a caulking gun, to use the larger tubes. And you can tool this product a bit if you like. That's approved by manufacturer instructions. Just use soapy water on your finger to work it down gently and try not to drag it out of the seam. You can clean up with mineral spirits if you have to. But this bead will be dry in about 24 hours and cured in about a week. Then you can paint it if you like. It's pretty easy to install and it's just a great line of protection against water seepage into the box. After that, we go inside and hit the reset button on the upstream GFCI. Power is restored to the circuit and the new outlet is now active, which we can test. We have power here and it's appropriately wired. So that's it. That's the whole install. Took less than an hour. I'm really glad I've got another receptacle out here and that we're up to code for the mini split installation that's coming later. And I'm super grateful that New Blue was here to do the job for me. Again, if you need electrical, plumbing, or HVAC work in North Carolina, check out New Blue. They've got multiple locations across the state, and they're expanding steadily. I can't wait to do more videos with them, and they're who I'm calling for any utility work on this house from now on. But that's it for today. I really hope this video was helpful. Let us know what you thought of it down below in the comments. I'll link some tools and materials from the video down there, along with all of New Blue's contact info. So, as always, thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Ethan James with TheHonestCarpenter.com. I'll see you next time.